to put it simply, an airbrush really is nothing more than a pen that sprays paint. Um, I'm taking it a step further than that. Obviously in the right hands you can create some fantastic work just with the airbrush or you can use it in conjunction with say, a paintbrush. Um, artists now are using erasers uh, to get the highlights in their, in their artwork. Um, so there's all sorts of things you can do with an airbrush. So what we'll do in this video is we'll just take you through the different kinds of airbrushes. Um, we'll have a look at how they work and um, basically just make you feel more at ease about the, the whole airbrush um, scene. So this is the uh, Badger Patriot. This is a gravity feed, meaning that you put paint in the cup here. And it's a double action, which means you press down for air and you pull back to allow the paint through. The next airbrush, still a double action. This is the Crescendo from Badger. The difference with this is, this is a suction feed or bottle feed, sometimes they're called. Um, the paint bottle plugs straight under here. This is still double action. We've got here now is the Badger 200. This is sick single action. This is also bottle feed as you can see. Um, single action means you press down for air and paint. There's no pulling back of the trigger. Uh, to adjust the, uh, the paint volume, this is by means of this screw adjuster at the back. Now this is what's called an external mix. Uh, single action airbrush by Badger. Now this, uh, to adjust the paint volume here, you actually have to um, adjust adjust this nozzle at the front. So that's all done externally. So I'll just run through a couple of the uh, features of each airbrush and then we'll uh, explain about paints etc. This is a double action airbrush, a gravity feed. Now there's one thing in common with all airbrushes, no matter what make or model, they all need air to make them work. And that is connected to the bottom here. So you need a compressor and an air hose. The air hose screws in here and then you're basically ready to go. Now this is a gravity feed, meaning that the, the paint goes in the cup here. When you press down for air and pull it back, the air pulls through paint through the front of the airbrush onto the surface. So it's down for air and back for paint. Now this is a little adapter you can get depending on what size hose you get. Basically, just plug your airbrush into that down for air and it's back for paint. So that's your double action. This is probably the, the most common airbrush you'll see on videos, um, instructional DVDs etc. Um, this is the airbrush that you need for, for any amount of detail work. So um, this, is, this is definitely the most popular airbrush. Okay, this is the Crescendo by Badger. Now, this is the same, uh, works on the same principle as the Patriot. Difference is, this is bottle feed. So basically, bottle full of paint plugs straight into the bottom of the airbrush. Uh, the beauty of this is, it's good for larger work like murals or uh, perhaps uh, painting cars, stuff like that anything that you'd need a, a large quantity of um, paint. But this is still double action, down for air, back for paint. Now what happens is, at the front here, there's a needle. And that runs through a nozzle. Pulling that back, withdraws the needle and allows paint through. Up until that point, the nozzle's blocked off. Now when you press down for air, air is allowed to go through the front of the airbrush because there's a gap around the nozzle itself. So when you press down, you only get air. Pulling it back withdraws the needle and allows paint through. Okay, this is the front end of the Patriot. You can see the needle sticking out of the nozzle. 
I'll just show you how this works exactly. So what you do is you press down on the trigger and you get air through. Pulling back on the trigger, the needle pulls back through the nozzle. So effectively at this point, we've blocked off the nozzle. Pulling it back, we're allowing paint through the nozzle. And that's all it is really. So the paint passes over the needle tip. Depending on how far back you pull the trigger, the, uh, the needle will move in slightly more or not quite so much. That gives you your variable paint flow and that's possible as you're actually airbrushing which is the difference between a, a single action or the external mix where you actually have to uh, preset that before you start painting. This is all possible as you go. That's what gives it uh, the double action, its versatility and its control. Now the needle is, um, you can get different size needles for different airbrushes. This, this model, the Patriot, actually has a, what they call a sort of a one size fits all needle and nozzle, meaning it's suitable for fairly fine lines and largest background spraying. Other airbrushes you get may have three different types of needle, needle and nozzle and they may be uh, more suitable for really, really tight work. Just depends what you're after really. So that's the basic principle of um, how a double action works. Okay, this is the Model 200 by Badger. This is the single action, as I said before. Um, you press this down, you get air and paint at the same time. Bottle feed as well. The way you adjust this is by screwing this in and out. That simply moves the needle in or out of the nozzle at a fixed rate. Depends what you want to paint and what kind of paint you're using. You can't actually adjust that while you're using it. You, you pre-adjust that before you start painting. So that's the difference between this and a double action. Uh, the thing with a single action is it's good for repetitive work. You could use it for murals. It's actually it's closer to the, the way a spray can works in that you don't really have any control on um, how much paint goes through once you press that button. Um, it's obviously more controllable than a spray can because with a spray can you've got no control. But, uh, but with this it works on the same sort of principle. So this would be good for uh, model making. Um, uh, murals as I said, anything that doesn't require really tight detail. Just thought I'd show you the front of the uh, Model 200 single action, just show you how this uh, how this operates. The front of it is basically the same as a double action, um, you can see the, the needle sticking out the nozzle. So when I turn this screw here it winds the needle in or out. As you can see it's a, it's a very fine thread so you can get some really fine adjustment on it. And all that's doing as I'm, as I'm doing that you can see it there, it's winding the needle out of the nozzle which would obviously give you uh, more paint going through. If you want to adjust it for less paint you just keep going until it practically blocks off the nozzle. So that's all there is to that. I said very simple but very effective. This is the Model 350 from Badger. Um, this airbrush differs to the, to the other three airbrushes. This is single action but the difference between this one and the other three is the fact that it's, um, it mixes the paint externally. So this is actually the nozzle. It's got a needle inside it. Um, Turning this allows the needle to uh, retract or protrude from this from this cone. So you fix a paint jar underneath. When you press this button, air from the hose is drawn up through the airbrush, and the paint is actually sucked out of the jar here. It's for sort of stippling backgrounds, general background spraying, stencil work. I guess you could use it for cake decorating. Um, anything that doesn't require any any finesse or any detail. Well, this is the uh, tip of the 350. Um, you can see the, the hole at the top of the cone there. Um, so if I turn this, I'm basically screwing this down. You'll be able to see the needle, the tip of the needle start to start to stick out. You can, you can see it just there. 
So effectively now the paint is blocked off. At the back, you can just see at the back there, there's a small hole. That's where the air comes out. So I'm screwing this nozzle. It's completely open now. Obviously that will give you a lot of paint coming through and the air would pass over the tip of the nozzle it gives you a spray of paint it's, it's, a, it's a very basic method of airbrushing if you like but um, in the right hands and depending on what you want to do this would be quite good for actually for doing a, um, special effects makeup on latex masks etc um, it's the kind of thing they use in the, in the special effects industry so, um, so that's basically how that works a common question um, asked by people that don't really know much about an airbrush is what kind of a spray pattern does an airbrush give? Well, all airbrushes give a round spray pattern. It's not a fan spray like a, like a spray gun. It's a round spray pattern. And the way you get a really fine line with your airbrush is you simply get closer to the surface. When you get really close to the surface, the paint hasn't had a chance to spread. So you'll get a hairline with it, depending on what airbrush you use, obviously. If you want to get a wider spray pattern, you just move back from the surface. It's as simple as that. Well, this is slate blue that I've got in here. This is sort of a, it's halfway up the colour scale for the uh, Spectrotex range. So this is a transparent, straight from the bottle this is. I'm running at about 5 psi with this, so it gives you an idea of the kind of line you can pull with the Renegade. It's got the 0.21 nozzle, it's an extremely fine line, got no issues with this whatsoever. I thought it might be uh, might be quite interesting for you to see how one of these comes to bits um, and I can show you the components inside and just sort of explain how it works internally. So, th as it, so this is the Patriot double action gravity feed. Um, the way I'm doing this isn't specific to this airbrush, it's, it's pretty common throughout the whole airbrush range um, worldwide really. So first off you, you take the handle off as you can see this is exposes uh, some of the parts inside it this is the end of the needle this is called the needle chucking nut so what you do is you loosen that off and you can pull the needle straight out so as you can see the needle runs the whole length of the airbrush ok now what we're going to do is I'm just going to take this off here now this is called the tensioner I'll take that off. Fine thread on that. Now there you can see the trigger spring. That is actually the thing that gives you tension um, throughout the airbrush to, to keep the needle seated against the nozzle. And I'll just unscrew this. Now this is called the uh, needle tube or the needle guide depends what terminology, um, well the terminology changes really from manufacturer to manufacturer so this is quite a fine thread and there you go that's that assembly out now what you can do is at the back of the trigger here we've got what's called the back lever or the trigger lever pull the trigger out there's nothing to that. And that's your back lever there. That rocks against the back of the trigger. So that's the back end of the airbrush taken to bits. You wouldn't want to go any further than that. There's no need to go inside this area here. There's just a spring and a plunger for the uh, to shut the air on and off. So moving around to the front of the airbrush there we 
we go. That's the air cap. This is the piece here that retains the nozzle into the front of the airbrush. And this is the this is the nozzle in the Patriot. This is a this is a cone shaped nozzle. There are no threads in this. Some airbrushes have threads in these and you need to you need to do it with a very small wrench, but this is one of the type. It sits in a machined um, face in the front of the airbrush, so there's no threads to strip or anything, so basically that just drops, it just sits in there. So that's that's it really, that's that's the airbrush stripped down. Um, as you can see it, it's very simple, there's nothing to be scared of within an airbrush. You'll get to know it um, within a matter of days, you know, it's it, there's, there's nothing to it. So when you put it back together again basically, you start from the front and we'll start to build up the, uh, the nozzle section again. Okay, we'll start on the front of the airbrush now, we'll build the uh, front of it back up again, we'll drop the nozzle in. It can be quite useful actually to stand uh, the airbrush up at this point, just so that the nozzle sits in while you're screwing the retainer on. Just make sure you don't bump the front of the nozzle, you don't want it damaged, make sure you don't get anything cross-threaded, so just does it finger tight, that's all. Okay, and then we put the nozzle cap or the spray regulator on, depending on uh, what manufacturer you're dealing with, and um, and that's that piece uh, finished. So that's the front of the airbrush built back up again. So now we'll move on to the back. All right, we've moved round to the back of the airbrush now. So we're going to screw this into the airbrush. Now this, you can see a slot, um, a flat machine on there. Now that rides in the corresponding flat in this section so just make sure you get that lined up otherwise it'll jam so just keep that lined up. Um, I found it's quite useful actually to hold the airbrush up like this when you're screwing this section in that way this drops down automatically. You keep doing this up now until it comes to a stop. There we go, just nip it up and that's that's it. That's all nice and free now. You can see it inside the airbrush body. So now what we'll do is we'll put the spring over, the spring tensioner, which I'll explain in a little bit. Make sure this is still in the right place, and we'll put the needle chuck nut on as well. So that section is now built up. What we're going to do is we're going to drop the trigger in in the back lever. You can see the needle tube riding inside the body there. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and pull this out of the way. So we'll pull it back, and then just grip it, and it'll stay in place. Then what we'll do is we'll drop the back lever in. Just make sure you get the right way around. So it's this it's this arc towards the back. Hook it in like so. And then we're just going to drop the trigger in. You'll feel it. It'll drop on top of the air plunger. You'll feel the trigger tension. Now if you just release the needle guide it's gone back in place there. So that's that all correctly built up now. That should be free, free like that. So make sure you test that before you actually drop the needle in. So we'll just turn that around now and we'll slide the needle in place. I like to press down on the trigger just to keep everything out of the way of the needle as it's going through and it won't bump against anything. And you'll feel it come against a, just a stop. That means it's actually hit the uh, nozzle and you don't need to go any further than that. So just nip up the uh, needle chuck nut, replace the handle, and that's it. 
Let's see boat up again. Okay, as I said before, I just wanted to show you um, about the spring tensioner. You can have this um, fairly light or a little bit stiffer, depending on how how you actually personally want it. So this is the this is the tensioner here. This is basically um, loading up the the spring inside here. Um, so backing that off will give you a looser feel, lighter feel. Doing this up all the way give a bit of, a bit of a heavier feel. So it's it's just just how you like the feel of it really. So that's the that's the tensioner. When it comes to the factory, it's just it's nipped up all the way. So it's up to you just how you do it for yourself. Another question is what kind of paints can I use through an airbrush? Well, the the simple answer to that is um, any paint you want really. The only paint that, that isn't suitable for an airbrush uh, are oil paints because they're just simply too thick. This is Spectratex by Badger. This is a um, this is a uh, an airbrush ready paint, meaning that it's thin enough to go through the airbrush straight from the bottle. Um, so that is one thing to consider. Um, you do need to thin your paint if it's not thin enough um, to get any level of detail and um, to make it actually work properly through your airbrush. So the paint needs to be sort of I would say almost like water to be honest. The thinner the better as long as you're not sort of um, making the paint too weak. So it's um, you can use inks, you can use watercolours, um, solvent paints like the same sort of paints that we use to paint a car in a factory. Um, anything like that is, is absolutely fine. The great thing about water-based paints obviously it's non-toxic. Um, I would recommend wearing a, a just like a dust mask or something if you're going to paint at home. Um, obviously solvent based paints um, you'd need to wear a proper mask and uh, some extraction as well so um, paints whatever you want apart from oil paints um, now once you actually get your equipment and um, decide to get some paints just think about what you're going to paint um, you, you may want to paint t-shirts or canvas or motorcycles or helmets or something like that a lot of the paints around nowadays are multi-surface paints, meaning that they can be used for t-shirts and bike parts, etc. So uh, just read the label, find out what's best for you. Um, Spectratex here is good for canvas work, um, t-shirts. So it's, it's, it's good for a, um, an array of different surfaces and obviously makes, uh, makes it cheaper to, to start painting when you've got a, a, a paint that can sort of do different things. So that's just another thing to bear in mind. Obviously another thing to take into account uh, when you're starting to airbrush is expense. Um, people ask you if it's, if it's expensive to airbrush. Um, not if you don't want it to be really. I mean once you've got your airbrush you've obviously got to um, consider um, the compressor. Compressors um, vary in price dra dramatically, um, even more so than airbrushes. You can get a really cheap compressor or you can get an expensive one. The expensive compressors are expensive for a reason, um, they're more user friendly for a start. Uh, a very cheap um, compressor, perhaps one that you'll get from a DIY store that may be um, applicable for a nail gun for example or pneumatic tools, might uh, it'll, it'll work an airbrush but it might not be the best thing you can get because they are so noisy. You've got to think about where you're going to actually paint, that's quite an important factor that people uh, forget about. You don't want to be painting at home in the middle of the night with one of these cheap compressors because you'll jump out your skin when it kicks in and you won't be very popular with the neighbours. So I would um, I would invest in a, a, a fairly quiet um, compressor. It'll it'll be worth it in the long run because you, you'll um, it'll save your sanity when you're painting. You really don't want that to being too noisy. So once you've got your airbrush and your compressor, the only thing then to get is um, is the paint and depending on what you paint and how much you paint um, even a single bottle of paint can last a long time so once you're kitted out with the, the airbrush and the compressor it really is a really really cheap hobby so um, that's all I can say really it's, um, it can be cheap